and uh, and, and nice to meet you, everyone. And it's uh, my honor for, for me this time to introduce Professor Wong, the Chief of the Surgical Center, the Clinical Hospital, Theophania, uh, President of the Kenya Association of Neurosurgeons. And uh, this time, we'll be presenting the basis of meningioma treatment. As a, as a young neurosurgeon, you always want to go back to the basics. So uh, without any delay, may I intro introduce uh, Professor Olenza? Can you uh, start uh, sharing your screen? Okay, I'm starting. Uh, Dr. Ben, uh, before that, uh, can we ask Professor Yoko Kato to say a few words before we start? Uh... It's, it's fine, it's sure, okay. Sure. Already okay. I, I, no I said hello, everybody. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for joining today, everybody. So, Alexander, please start your lecture. Okay, can I start? Okay. Thanks. Yes. So, dear colleagues, dear friends, friends, uh, thank you again for invitation. It's a great honor, great pleasure. Uh, it's my really pleasure, real pleasure to be a part of your uh, team of Asian uh, Neurosurgical Congress. So, thank you again, again. Uh, today, it's really I will deliver uh, many um, really basic lecture, but it's based on my uh, mainly on my own experience. So. I, all of uh, the statements I will say about, I will speak about, uh, pass it through my, my experience. And I think they are very, very, very important. And uh, we must follow them in our practice when we manage the, manage the meningioma. This is my hospital in a very, very nice, very beautiful summer. Today we will talk about the. Uh, a little bit about origin of tumor, about uh, the location, uh, classification, uh, specific of growth. Uh, um, I will focus it on the resection of the tumor, uh, histopathology of the tumor, prognosis, and uh, uh, we will speak, we will discuss uh, when it's worth to be to operate this tumor, why it must be operated now, and uh, the, and how we will uh, do it. Uh, first of all, a few words about uh, meningioma biology. You know that they arise from uh, arachnoid uh, cup cells, uh, uh, and uh, it's most convenient for us. And the name of meningioma uh, was given by Professor by uh, Harvey Cushing and. Uh, we use it routinely for, for nowadays. Uh, the um, universal feature of these tumors uh, is uh, their fixation to the bone and dura matter, except the intraventricular uh, tumors. And uh, as they, were, they grow from the uh, bone, they invade the dura and they uh, cause the formation of hyperostosis. And I want to remind you that, that hyperostosis is the all is also tumor. And when we uh, plan the operation, we must plan the removal of uh, all these hyperostosis to prevent to prevent the recurrence of the tumor. Also, the biological feature of uh, meningioma is their invasion to the brain tissue. You must remember it, it's, it's, it's extremely important uh, when the tumor is located at the uh, eloquent areas. Uh, it's better to leave a small shell of the tumor on the surface of the cortex than to be aggressive and uh, remove the, all the tumor. According to classification, this classical, uh, most majority of the tumors are benign. They are grade one tumors. And uh, there is a group about 20% of the tumor are not benign, the atypical and uh, anaplastic tumors. Uh, we will speak uh, them about a little bit later. Uh, the main principles of surgery of meningioma were formulated by Harvey Cushing in their manuscript uh, meningioma, their classification, regional behavior, life uh, history, and surgical and result uh, hard over. But uh, we, when we speak about Harvey Cushing, we mm, forget about 
another person who was always a side of him. I think uh, if uh, he had not uh, the assistant like Louisa Eisenhardt, uh, we would not have many, many publications and many, many um, important conclusions from the Cushing, Cushing, uh, uh, Cushing uh, um, experience. So um, I recommend you to read uh, the biography of this uh, lady. I think she was the first uh, lady uh, in neurosurgery uh, who um, made the very, very, very big contribution to the development, development of neurosurgery. I, I, so, uh, so, so please, we, we very often we forget about it. About diagnosis, it's classical MRI is the golden standard. Uh, uh, CT uh, shows us shows at, uh, the MRI with the, with the um, enhancement is very, you know, of, of course. Uh, CT, on the CT we can see the bone structure, the hyperostosis, the calcination inside of tumor and angiography. Concerning angiography, we do not uh, know and perform the angiography routinely for uh, all the meningiomas, but some meningiomas in some, some locations uh, located, uh, when we speak especially about uh, skull-based meningiomas, it's very important to perform the angiography and maybe Maybe uh, and maybe perform the embolization of the tumor. We will speak about it about later. Uh, classification: uh, the the main classification uh, is uh, classification uh, according to the tumor location. It's the convexity tumors. When we speak about convexity, we say um, we. Um, we classify them according to the location to the lobes of the brain, frontal, temporal, uh, occipital, and so on. Uh, Felsine and parasagittal. Uh, they are very similar. Sometimes on the MRI, we cannot uh, say which is uh, only at the time of surgery, we can uh, find out uh, uh, we do, we deal with the uh, uh, parasagittal and uh, uh, felsine. Parasagittal meningioma uh, is uh, attached to the convex bone and then it extends uh, along the folks downwards and it uh, shifts the bridging veins uh, downwards. And when you open the dura, you do not see the bridging veins. They are they are under the way. Well, this is the difference. The difference when we see, do not see the veins on the su surface of the tumor. This is a parasagittal. If uh, the veins are on the surface of the tumor, when tumor um, started to grow from the folds, so the the, the, vein, the bridging veins are on the surface. This is it's a very important difference uh, between. And uh, there is a group of the tumor which are located so-called convexity, Fox angle. They, they, it's you, you can be difficult, but these uh, tumors are most challenging for neurosurgery because usually they invade the wall of the mm, sagittal sinus uh, and. Uh, um, the radical removal it is quite uh, difficult. Intraventricular tumor, the tumor uh, usually located uh, at the um, lateral ventricles or in the fourth ventricle. Conversely, today I wouldn't speak about uh, them a lot. And skull-based tumor, we classify them then to the according to the location at the uh, anterior, uh, middle, or posterior fossa. Um, uh, also, we separate a group of so-called recurrent meningiomas. Recurrent meningiomas, they, which uh, require very special approaches to their treatment. According, according to treatment, we have uh, in our um, arsenal, we have uh, three main uh, methods uh, for treatment. And first of them, I discuss, I discuss the observation. Uh, the surgery is the main method, radio surgery, and I separate the adjuvant therapy. We, we will speak about it a little 
a bit later. Observation. It's very interesting that about the half of uh, incidental meningiomas do not grow during a long uh, follow-up time. Um, the growing of uh, meningioma is uh, very much age-related. First of all, you remember that um, uh, women, women have these tumors uh, four times more than uh, uh, men population. And uh, also meningioma is a very hormone-related, uh, uh, hormone, uh, uh, hormone-sensitive. You know that the meningioma has uh, estrogen and progesterone receptors. And the peak of their uh, active growth is the premenopausal and menopausal period uh, of, of uh, uh, women. Um, after 60 years old, the meningioma usually grow very, very slowly. After 70, usually they do not, do not grow at all. This is that of literature, and it's my personal observation. That is why the observation is a very strong uh, method for management of, especially of incidental uh, manager. When to operate, it's a little bit discussable. Some, there are some publications when uh, uh, doctors uh, try to uh, connect the activity of tumor uh, tumor growing uh, the um, gaining of volume but it's very difficult to calculate so for me uh, the first of all if tumor becomes uh, asymptomatic this is the first for uh, tumor for um, administration to, for the surgery and another one the edema even if even when tumor doesn't grow on MRI, but we, but we can see the more and more intensive peritumoral edema, it's, uh, we must uh, think about about the surgery and uh, think about resection of the tumor. Uh, this is the case. Uh, it's my my observation. A lady, is 70 years, uh, 79 year old lady, uh, 2014 was first diagnosed tumor without any uh, symptoms. Then we performed uh, controls without enhancement because of uh, some uh, nephropath nephropathy in the patient. Uh, she, she was not symptomatic until this year. And you can see there's no growth of the tumor during uh, eight years. Now she's 77 and uh, tumor, tumor doesn't grow at all. Uh, so when and why operated, I, I, I told you about it, that maybe from some, according to some uh, publications, the author, authors uh, um, proposed to calculate the volume or increase of volume of the tumor, but I think that the clinical, clinical manifestation is more, more, more important than just uh, tumor growing. Uh, the classically, I was taught and the majority of your were taught that uh, there are made three main steps for meningioma removal. Uh, tumor detachment, tumor debucking, and tumor dissecting. Yes, but I'd uh, a little extend a little bit this D uh, uh, D classification, and uh, on the first first uh, position I'd put the positioning of the patient and the approaches. Before surgery, we must think about it. Why we will discuss a little later. Then before surgery we must think uh, how we, we will devascularize the tumor. In case of uh, meningi meningioma, it's very important because you know, because it's very bloody tumor. It's a very uh, intensive uh, blood supply, blood outflow, and this tumor uh, produces uh, the vascular, uh, the, uh, produces the factors, they uh, stimulate the prolifer proliferation of the 
um, of the vessels. Uh, drilling of the involved bone is so also important because we perform it after tumor removal uh, or maybe before in case of uh, convex stop. And uh, decompression of the brain and cranial nerves. We, we, I separated this uh, point because sometimes we cannot be absolutely radical during uh, tumor removal. So in this case, we must provide the clinical uh, at least stabilization of the patient. So if we cannot remove all the tumor, we, we, at least we must decompress the critical structures, decompress the brain, decompress the cranial nerve, nerve and provide. So altogether, uh, I, I'd uh, speak about 6D for meningioma removal plus positioning and uh, approach choice. Uh, according to approach, um, approach of course always must be, uh, must be adequate. So all must be adequate surgery, it must, and we must think about uh, the cosmetic effect of the tumor. And few words about uh, this uh, fashion of small uh, craniotomies, especially eyebrow incision. Uh, 20 years ago, I, was, I also was very enthusiastic about this small approach, uh, performed it, uh, operated on via this. But um, in three, five, six years, I noticed that uh, this small bone flap uh, starts to, or starts to uh, uh, start to move down due to bone lesions, and the patients had some cos cosmetic, uh, not good cosmetic effect uh, on the place. Maybe skin was smooth and normal, but the, but this uh, but this uh, uh, small hole we could see it, we could see it on the on the forehead, and uh, people put some something to fill this cave, and uh, maybe during last 10 years i do not use uh, the skull the eyebrow uh, ex uh, approach at all uh, due to cosmetic reasons much better much easier to perform to perform the hairline uh, uh, hairline uh, ex um, hairline approach uh, to, uh, skin incision uh, when we plan approach, we must uh, expose the maximum of the of the tumor. When you speak about uh, convexital, so the bone flap must be much bigger than uh, tumor to see all the all the surround uh, tissues. In case of skull base uh, of parasagittal meningioma, we must provide the exposure of the sinus. For example, parasagittal, we always uh, open. The, the bone uh, to the opposite side, uh, as well as uh, we, when we operate on the uh, tentorial meningioma, we also expose the uh, transverse sinus on the both side to, to, to be able to approach the uh, tentorium from, from the both sides to control the blood supply and so on and so on. Uh, according to the brain reduction, uh, I will speak about it but later, but later, but uh, as much as possible, we must plan the um, brain, brain retract, retraction due to gravity. Uh, and the, when the brain goes down without, by, by the natural uh, reasons. About one closure, it's, it's, it's clear. And uh, what is very important, it's, uh, the approach must be comfort for neurosurgeon because we are working for three, four, five, six uh, hours during removal remodels, and uh, uh, the surgeon must feel comfortable uh, to, to work more, more, more effectively. And a few words, and I will go on the um, discussion about minimal uh, invasive neuro neurosurgery. And uh, I want to express uh, my skeptical, uh, my skeptical uh, point of view to the so-called uh, uh, keyhole approach. So when we speak keyhole, 
Of course, of course, it's very important, but uh, keyhole is a window to the some uh, to some area, but uh, the keyhole is not a small. It's not. It doesn't mean the small cranium to me. So cranium to me always must be adequate to perform the different different angles of view to the tumor. Uh, to minimize uh, the um, risks of uh, complications and the uh, uh, approach must provide you the ability to manage any complication or so on and so on. Uh, a few words about brain relaxation. Uh, I want to, to remind you of this uh, classic work uh, by uh, Professor Sugita and Kabayashi. They measure it the reaction of the brain to the uh, compression of the brain. Please, please read it. It's very, very interesting. And it's uh, still actual, though it was uh, published in 1987, but it's uh, still actual. Um, how can we minimize and provide the brain relaxation during surgery, especially in cases of patients with meningioma? Uh, we think about before surgery and uh, pre-operative pre um, therapy by steroids, uh, it uh, improves uh, the results, it uh, uh, eases uh, the brain retraction during surgery and minimize uh, the trauma. Position of the patient also, as I told, is very important. Uh, uh, CSF drain is the main, I think it's the main uh, step for providing of uh, brain relaxation. Uh, when we operate uh, the basal tumor, very important to open the cistern and drain the CSF. When it's a frontotemporal approach, obterior approach, uh, I usually open, I start from the opening of the sylvian fissure and obtaining the CSF and then go on to the, uh, to the cellar cistern. When we speak, when we go retrosig, uh, very important to start from draining the CSF from the cerebellar medullary system to, to obtain the as one as you as you have the CSF, you, you will feel like brain will go down, go on, down, go on, down, go on, down. Uh, um, also, we can obtain uh, the CSF from ventricles and from from cysts if uh, they they are. Uh, I we do not use the puncture of ventricles in our practice for many, many, many years, but sometimes uh, it could be helpful during some accidental cases. We can use this also. We can drain the CSF from the, um, uh, from the um, laminar terminalis. Also must remain, remember about it. Mm. Intraop medication is sometimes it's helpful, but usually I I do not rely rely on, on it much. Sometimes we, we ask for hyperventilation. Someone we ask about some uh, bolus steroids, but uh, it works. But uh, do do not rely on it in your on it in your practice. So, um, then even if you have not enough relaxed uh, brain, it's better to start from the uh, tumor debugging uh, to, uh, to gain the additional space. And tumor devascularization by itself, on the, not on the removal, but on the devascularization will provide you the brain relaxation because you uh, will reload the vein system of the brain as you will stop the blood arterial uh, blood supply of the meningioma uh, you will uh, you will um, decrease the uh, vein blood outflow to the veins and the, so the, it will help it will help you to also to gain the additional space uh, during uh, during uh, surgery sometimes very rare but uh, we we must uh, perform the brain resections in some in some very rare cases maybe but sometimes uh, we also must remember that as a it's a, of course it's a extraordinary extraordinary 
measure external other step, but sometimes it's uh, it's wise to do it during uh, meningioma removal. Uh, when when I speak about the windows and uh, I, I will I want to return to the um, so-called uh, keyhole surgery. Uh, much better to create the window. This, this is the example uh, of surgery of the not meningioma but craniopharyngioma. When when we come, you can see how small was uh, the. Uh, It was small. After uh, after drilling of the clinoid, after unroofing of the optic canal, we obtained very good space for, for our surgery, practically, practically without any retraction of the nerve and uh, the artery. And then we go on when we need. Uh, we speak with, uh, I told you about the. Uh, uh, opening of the lamina terminalis. Uh, if we need, we can use this corridor. Uh, uh, now let us discuss the meningioma devascularization. Um, it's been shown that there is no sense to, to embolize all the meningioma before surgery. Uh, when we expect the high vascularity of the tumor, we can, we can predict it according to the MRI data, on the, from the MRI data, then we can plan the um, angiography and, uh, and uh, um, embolization of the tumor. But I do not. Uh, I do not recommend to use it. Uh, use uh, embolization routinely. If you feel that you technically can can devascularize this tumor during surgery, it's much better and easier to perform this during surgery than to uh, than to embolize it. According according to tumor uh, devascularization, you, there are different. Uh, different ways uh, of, of, of devas devascularization. First, we can devascularize tumor by drilling of the bone before tumor removal. And in this bone, you would block the arterial supply of the tumor. It's very good, but not always possible. For example, at the cases of uh, olfactory groove for meningioma, it's impossible, and I'd not recommend it to do it, but it's just it's a schematic showing. Then, uh, direct feeder coagulation uh, in between the tumor and the bone, and it's, and it's endura. It's the best way, I think, most effective, but uh, not always, uh, not always possible. But in in majority cases, it's it could be possible. Uh, and the third way to devascularize you tumor, especially in the case of, I use this this um, uh, I use this method um, in surgery of olfactory groove meningioma. I move through the tumor, then I find the uh, filling arteries and coagulate and cut them inside of the tumor, inside of the tumor, and then I remove uh, the the rest of the tumor, uh, which was located on the on the skull base. Here you, I can show you this middle meningeal artery during surgery of uh, during the anterior petrosal approach. Uh, you can see when uh, usually when when we operate the sphenopetroclival meningioma, uh, the block of uh, mini, uh, middle meningia let you to devascularize it uh, very effectively. Uh, this is uh, the coagulation of the. Mm, um, feeders uh, during surgery of olfactory groove meningioma. And this is a clinoidectomy, extradural clinoidectomy before the meningioma, removal of the meningioma of anterior clinoid. When, once, when we mm, drill it out, 
we usually devascularize this, this tumor completely, can remove it absolutely, absolutely safely. Concerning meningioma detachment, uh, detachment, uh, the only convexity meningiomas could be detached uh, from the estate uh, uh, site uh, safely. All other meningiomas, uh, we will meet, uh, in case of all other meningiomas, we will, we will meet uh, the problem with the detachment of this tumor. And uh, sometimes uh, we can detach uh, the tumor only at the final stage of the surgery, like in the uh, uh, cases of uh, olfactory groom meningioma. Usually I leave a small tumor on the bone and on the, uh, for complete removal of the tumor, I, I resect the remnant of the tumor for the skull base and then, and then I drill out the bone, the bone invaded by the tumor. Uh, concerning meningioma de uh, uh, debarking, Usually meningiomas grow, uh, grow extensively and uh, in majority of cases, you can safely uh, reject the tumor uh, to, to manipulate inside the tumor uh, with some exclusions. Of course, when, we, when it's a uh, meningioma of uh, cavernous sinus, when it's meningioma of anterior clinoid, uh, that is why, but in majority cases, we can, Perform the very good debugging with the ultrasound aspirator, with the scissors, with the anything. It led us to shrink the tumor, to relax the tumor. And then after tumor debugging, when we debug, we, we have we have the rem, uh, residual shell of the tumor. And I use in this case, I use, sorry. I use a so-called parachute trick. Uh, when I pull the bends, usually the bends uh, uh, have, have direction from the point of tumor attachment uh, to the periphery of the tumor. And when you coagulate them, they shrink and they, dis they distract the tumor. Uh, and uh, it's easy you to, to get the um, dissection plane. This is, uh, for me, it's very, very, very uh, important uh, uh, trick for meningioma removal. Um, when, you remove, when meningioma grows up, usually it, uh, it's uh, surround the arteries and the nerves. And if we will try to retract the tumor along its surface, we will uh, damage them get some bleed and as a result patient, patient will have a, a post-op deficit. That is why I also I recommend also the pull tumor pull tumor at the direction opposite opposite to, to their growth to their extension. In this if we will use this trick this method we minimize the risk risk of um, uh, sacrificing of the arteries at uh, veins which are invaded or adhered uh, to the surface of the, of the tumor. Uh, according to this section, actually it's very, like this, there is a universal rule for meningioma. So we can dissect it from the surface of the brain or so from the anatomical structure only in cases when we have the cleavage, when we have the plane for arachnoid dissection. No arachnoid plane, no dissection. So uh, if a tumor located in the locked areas, uh, it's better to leave a small shell of the tumor, small shell of the tumor, than to, than to try to be aggressive, to remove it aggressively. The cooperation of the narrow cranial uh, brain and uh, cranial nerves. Uh, I, I gave a lecture according to the compression uh, dedicated to um, uh, the compression of optic pathways. Uh, I think it was at, uh, at the Congress of uh, Young Neurosurgeons, Asian Young Neurosurgeons. 
neurosurgeons, but uh, I want to emphasize that it's very, very important to decompress uh, anatomical, uh, important anatomical structure, structures, even if you uh, have, if you, even if uh, you cannot remove the tumor completely. This is the strangulation of optic nerve. When, the, when it was released when after the resection of falciform form ligament. Uh, according to the reading, it's a very, very well um, proven uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the invaded bone is, uh, it's invaded bone, it's, it's a tumor. And uh, if we want to be maximally radical, it's much better to remove uh, the invaded bone completely. But um, it's not always possible. And, uh, sometimes we must plan resection, uh, not to create a new, a new complication of the sur surgery. What is very important um, that there during for during of for sorry for meningioma surgery the preservation of uh, cerebral veins uh, very often uh, the uh, the meningioma um, in fo fold the tumors it's uh, fold the veins it's, it's almost sometimes it's impossible to dissect the meningioma from the vein in this case it's better to leave the ven venous uh, drainage uh, than to um, then to block the vein outflow from the from the brain because the vein infarctions are more severe and the uh, patients recover from them much worse than from the arterial infarction. We must remember it, that, that is why we always must preserve the vein. Um, I would like to direct you to this uh, big, big article by Professor Sandu. Uh, find it in the, uh, in the library or find it in the internet. Uh, it's a basic, basic work uh, where Professor Sandu uh, describes uh, describes the anatomy of the veins and the way and the ways how to preserve the vein. Uh, also, I would also remind want to remind you this uh, publication by uh, Professor Sugita uh, how to how to preserve the veins during uh, meningioma surgery. Seems on great scale, it's a good scale to describe the resectability of the tumor, but it's been, sorry, but it's been shown. Excuse me. Simpson grade, uh, it's called well, very well known Simpson grade scale. Uh, but uh, uh, it's been very well shown that uh, only histobiological features of the meningioma are more and more predictable for tumor recurrence than uh, the grade of tumor resection. And uh, I like this this picture and uh, I want to, and I like this phrase that we can teach a monkey to operate, but we can teach uh, it when to stop. Really, uh, in surgery of meningioma, it's very 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 important to really to fill the point. Uh, well, we must stop with our activity, with our, uh, with our aggressiveness. Like an example, this case. Uh, Sveno Petro Tentorio Meningioma, when uh, we decided to operate it on by uh, suboccipital, suboccipital subtentorial approach, it was resected from the posterior fossa. So we stopped on the border of the tumor, we left the piece of tumor of uh, the CCT and, and MRI, we left the tumor in, inside of the cavernous sinus, but patient has no 
new neurological deterioration after surgery, after surgery. Then we will observe this tumor. And in case it will grow, we will think about, uh, about the irradiation. But concerning closure, the universal uh, rule is uh, the wound must be closed watertightly. In any ways, fat, fastella, uh, artificial dura, any any way in, in any ways, but uh, peri pericranium, but it must be closed uh, closed uh, hermetically, and the bone must be reconstruct reconstructed in different ways. Adjuvant therapy of meningioma, which we have in our armamentarium, it's uh, radiotherapy high dose fractionated radiotherapy, radio surgery, proton beam, uh, sometimes chemotherapy and uh, hormonal therapy, which is not effective at all, but we can meet it uh, in the literature. According to my experience, I want to say that the radio uh, irradiation of the meningioma is, uh, is very dangerous. So it's, uh, we cannot predict the behavior of the tumor after radiation. Of course, in, in many cases, it could be effective, especially in case of uh, radio surgery. It could be effective, but in some patients, uh, meningioma may, uh, could be transformed to malignant form and uh, it uh, actually, and we will switch on the backward uh, count down for the patient. So we must remember about it and just be very careful with the irradiation of meningioma, especially for big meningioma, with the, which can uh, be stimulated mostly by, by the uh, irradiation. But for some tumor, for the small tumors, for the, some residual tumor, Gamma knife, of course, is a tool of treatment. Uh, this illustrated illustrated case uh, from last year. This patient was irradiated in some of in some of institutions in my country. Uh, of course, it uh, started to deteriorate after high dose fractionated radiotherapy. Uh, the edema. You can see the severe edema around the tumor. So. The patient was operated on, and we removed completely this tumor uh, without any problems at all, without uh, no neurological deterioration. So this is a, a really a case where where um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, indicated. Uh, a few words about uh, neuromonitoring. So, I, so far, I cannot imagine uh, surgery of meningioma, especially especially skull-based meningioma, uh, without uh, this tool. So it's, now it must be routine uh, for the for, for our surgery. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, I want to say that meningiomas are still the most challenging tumor uh, for uh, excision not keyhole, but open window surgery for meningiomas, no blind manipulation at any stage of surgery, only devascularized meningioma could be removed safely. We discussed it with you. A functional result, result for the patient and his, and his quality of life is about all, uh, not, uh, it's not the extension of resection. Uh, meningioma histobiology is more predictive than tumor location and the grade of tumor resection. Uh, radio surgery is an adjuvant and palliative tool for meningioma treatment. But remember that radio surgery is one more tool in hand of neurosurgeon. Everything that can be safely removed must be removed. What you cannot remove, we can, we, we can send uh, to the radio surgery and, all the, and only in case when we are sure that uh, tumor is not controlled, it started to grow. To grow. Uh, and uh, despite 
of the large number of publications which promise with promising results of non-invasive methods of meningioma, microsurgical removal remain the most, most effective uh, so far. So thank you for, for your attention. So thank you, Professor, for your uh, excellent lectures. Sure. You're so, welcome. Uh, yeah, it's very useful for Yan Yu. So may I invite your Professor uh, Yo Kato to say a few words? Uh, Professor Kato, you need to unmute your mic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much for a very basic, yeah. but it's very important lecture for all of us, not only for young neurosurgeon. Thank you so much. So, Thank you. Ben, can I ask something to the Alexander or Ben? Yes, Professor. Sure. Uh, okay, yes, okay. Sure. So, so, just uh, if you have uh, some uh, definition of the malignant the meningioma, for some times, uh, uh, kind of the sarcoma. So do you have any uh, definition or how we can treat or how we can uh, follow? Can you tell us, please? Uh, when, when we, uh, according uh, the meningioma transformed to sarcoma, you, you mean? Yes, I, I understand yes. it clearly. Uh, yeah. uh, first of all, I will um, share my responsibility with the oncologist. In this case, in this case, in case of really malignant tumor, uh, we will work together with the uh, oncologist and radiologist. In this case, I will invite them and we will discuss all together what to do. So I would not, if I have a, a really malignant tumor, it's much better to uh, uh, to share the responsibility for this patient, not to take uh, to uh, decision by yourself by by, by neurosurgeon because it's a malignant tumor. So in in this case we must uh, we must uh, plan this uh, the adjuvant uh, uh, therapy and some uh, some different method maybe irradiation before surgery, but usually it doesn't work. Anyway, we we, we will. Anyway, we will start from uh, maximal possible resection. Any, anyway, okay. but only after after um, considering uh, after consultation with the oncologist and radiologist. Okay. So, do you have any? Uh, okay, so maybe the, the, do you have any idea of the, the feature of the uh, radiological uh, findings, such as a huge edema or location or whatever? For, for for what for malignant meningioma? Ma ma malignant, yes. For malignant, uh, of course, uh, usually this tumor are surrounded uh, by the um, edematous uh, brain. Uh, they are very aggressive. This tumor, and uh, um, what what else? Uh, there, there there is a typical features on the T, T on the T2 sequences what they, but they, it's a, usually a radiologist uh, give me this information but I, when I see the aggressive tumor and uh, we have no pathohistology and I'm, I'm not I do not know exactly it's a benign or it's not benign uh, because we, we we never perform the biopsy by itself. Uh, we perform the maximal possible resection. Sometimes maybe we send the sample uh, during surgery to our pathologist. Uh, to, but if, even if we, we get the information about the tumor malignant, we do not stop anyway. We, uh, we, anyway, anyway, we are maximally, maximally aggressive during surgery. Okay, thanks. So one, one more question, uh, Jesse, you can give me and uh, give us some suggestion. Uh, 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 of course, you uh, emphasize about the keyhole, so you do not like a keyhole surgery. But recently, so many endoscopic resection, so that is uh, not a keyhole, but also the, the minimally invasive for the patient. So, how, how do you think uh, that where is uh, uh, how we can uh, uh, understand the uh, endoscopic the resection? It's, it's getting it's getting popular. 
Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Especially in Japan, uh, you have uh, you made a very good, uh, very good development of uh, the endoscopy during uh, during recent 10 years, I guess. Uh, and really, I've, I've seen the excellent surgeries uh, performed by endoscopic surgeon. Actually, they do the same microsurgery with endoscope with a good, especially good team with the uh, two uh, endoscopists and the neurosurgeon, especially Professor Provadel, you know, it's uh, classical. I, I really I, I like his uh, surgery, but I'm not so much experienced in, the, in endoscopic. And uh, uh, I want to um, emphasize that uh, uh, we can do it uh, after very good training when we are absolutely confident in our manipulation. And uh, when we are sure that we do not bring more risk for this surgery. So only in case of very, very high, uh, very, very big experience in neurosurgeon, endoscopic neurosurgery, we can uh, make this step to the keyhole endoscopic surgery. So for me, I don't have so much experience in this, and I will never do it. I will never do it by myself. Someone okay. can, can it? He's uh, confident in his practice. Okay, let let do. It. It's good. But in my practice, I'm I'm not. I use in my everyday practice. I use the endoscope mostly as a control tool uh, to control the extension of resection, to to see the cavity, to uh, watch behind the angle. So and that's that's all. Some manipulation, some resection. In transvenoidal, of course, I use. But in transcranial, only only like uh, like uh, uh, adjuvant method not, not the main method for surgery in my hands maybe the next generation the younger sur <laughs> surgeons i will do it and it's complicated and uh, i promise them to do it uh, safely and, uh, and effectively well, anyway thank you very much for the excellent lecture congratulation thank you very much you're welcome ben? yes thank you so much and may i also invite uh, professor ibrahim the president and associate of the surgeon in post in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, for your opinion. Hey, hello, everybody. Professor Ibrahim. Hello. Uh, good to see you again, Professor uh, Bosnia. A nice lecture. I like it very much. Thank you for that. Uh, just, just few comments, actually, uh, or, or question. Let me say, uh, how is about your experience with uh, uh, stereotactic radio surgery, for example, for small meningiomas? Uh, let me say less than two centimeters in some uh, critical areas uh, close to neurovascular structures and so. Uh, do you think that we should uh, follow those small pontocerebral angle uh, meningiomas or central skull base or, or uh, some surgeons are preferred to send the patient, even young guys, to the stereotactic radio surgery before the open classical microsurgery. So any experience about that uh, or, or accommodation to start with the uh, surgery or with the uh, stereotactic radio? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your question. Uh, first of all, it depends of age of the patient. Of the patient. First, uh, um, if it's a young patient, I always will recommend surgery. No, I, I, I do not recommend to play uh, with the radio surgery for young. If uh, the patient after 60, of course, and the patient and the tumor is located um, uh, in the areas you told about, and you are sure the tumor is progressing, because I will start from observation. I, I told you about it. I, I use this tool. I really, I, I'm not aggressive neurosurgeon. I observe for three months, six months, nine, one year, year by year. I have many, many patients uh, under observation. So it depends. On, so in young patients, I will never recommend the radio surgery because the methods by itself, it's very young. We do not know what, what will be in 20 years after radio surgery. We have no good statistic even for about this. About this. Um, from, from the other hand, uh, um, I don't see I don't see any problem in the removal of the small tumor for CP angle or anterior clinoid or uh, even small petroclival. So technically, it's not it's not so difficult. We can remove it. So 
usually I discuss it with my, with my patient and we discuss uh, the possible results of radio surgery so what we can expect for, from from it uh, and uh, i explain that some the risks of possible risks of, of surgery but usually the surgery of the small tumors it's not so difficult much much uh, much more difficult to operate the bigger tumors bigger they they adhere it they are they involve the tumors so that is why, in general, I wouldn't recommend uh, radio surgery for small tumors. I will start from observation, then I will discuss it with patient, and if patient uh, is, is not intended to be operated on, of course, uh, I will send it to radio surgery. That, that, this is my position. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question no. uh, is concerning the, the, the large tumors, uh, for example, uh, con convexity meningioma, which is very well supplied, for example, by the mean, uh, middle meningeal artery or so. Uh, do you have any experience with the preoperative endovascular treatment, devascularization endovascular by, by the guy who doing that? And uh, do you think is it necessary or is of helpful? Or if yes, how do you think it's it's better to start with the surgery on the day of endovascular treatment or day after or any experience about that or, or, or suggestion okay thank you um, when we speak about, about convexity meningiomal i will never think about the embolization of this tumor in cases of sphenoid wind meningioma really it's it's worse to perform angiography and uh, embolize and we do it but uh, for convexity meningioma there is a good trick uh, i start no, not i my colleagues uh, they start drilling of the bone across the meninge meningeal middle meningeal artery uh, uh, and block the uh, main blood supply before before the before the craniotomy so we start from drilling. We we, we drill out uh, such a uh, such a bar. We can see and control the meningeal artery. We we coagulate it, and only after that we perform the whole the craniotomy. It's a trick which help helps us to devascularize, devascularize this tumor quite easily without blood loss during. Because if we will start to perform craniotomy, then uh, then to uh, then to rise the flap, we will lose one and one one point five liter uh, at this surgery. So that is why we start from uh, from devascularization, and then we we will perform the the craniotomy and remove the. A tumor without without any problems. Thank you, thank you very You're much. Uh, thank you, Professor Ibrahim. And uh, may I also uh, invite uh, Professor Ash Kuhn, the Assistant Professor of the Cerebrovascular and Vascular Neural Surgery from the Sunny Book, the University of uh, Toronto, to share your thank comments you. and your questions. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Professor Wozniak, this was a, a a very a basic, but as Professor Caro said, very, very important uh, and eloquent lecture. Thank you so much. I, I will just add on to a few points because I think uh, uh, for young neurosurgeons, your lecture was uh, a complete uh, uh, masterclass. So um, you said observation. So I agree for most of the points. If you especially see a big calcified tumor uh, where there is no surrounding perilational edema, you know that this is not going to grow. And we see this in, in, in many patients where the growth uh, for these patients will, will never happen. So if it's completely calcified and you're seeing this on a plain CT, there's no need to chase it. Uh, that's one. Uh, the second thing for surgery, you, normally what I do is look after the T2-weighted images. And if it is hyper-intense or hyper-intense, gives you some idea about whether what's the uh, water content of the, uh, the meningioma, whether it'll be firm, whether it'll be uh, very uh, soft. So it gives you a little bit of more, uh, you know, mental preparation that you, you, you'll be in there for a longer time. Embolization, because I do uh, uh, do a lot of endovascular neurosurgery, but I'm yet to do my first tumor embolization. 
it's because uh, I'm doing it for six, seven years. We never, never operate for uh, for uh, embolization of meningiomas. And, and that's, uh, that's one another point for young neurosurgeons when I was saying that if it's a surgeon who is doing both the things, he understands it better, whether you can approach it uh, surgically and devascularize by techniques which you already mentioned, or you want to put in a catheter and put some particles by the way, through minimal angel artery, those particles can easily go into the into the ICA. So these abnormal connections, which are which are which develop between the ECA and the ICA branches, need to be very very carefully looked upon. And for the surgery, I mean, the the counter view is it becomes soft, it becomes easily suckable. The surgery becomes uh, very quick. There's very less blood loss. But I think because we do we have done both the things, we know actually that it's not that much of a blood loss. So you can actually, uh, you know, devascularize the tumor in a in, in much better way, surgically rather than doing an MMA embolization, uh, because that procedure is not risk-free. And the same goes for MMA embolization for chronic subdual hematomas, because that's a new trend. Uh, everyone is doing a mental meningeal embolization for chronic subdual hematomas, it's, and especially for mass with mass effects. So I don't think so that's a, 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 a diagnosis which you treat with uh, endovascular neurosurgery. And the last thing I will say is about brain invasion, Professor Wozniak. Uh, I mean, I think finger uh, like projections that you see on a, on a contrast uh, uh, scan, and if you don't, especially on a flare, if you see an extensive edema, you can anticipate that there may be a brain invasion, although brain invasion is a pathological uh, diagnosis. And it, it's, it commonly goes with the grade two and grade three uh, aplastic and anaplastic meningiomas, sure. as you said. So. Um, yeah, that that's that's all. Um, thank you so much for your uh, excellent lecture. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Kumar. Thank you very much. Uh, coding embolization. I want to. There is uh, some administ administrative uh, obstacles for for this. Uh, for in my hospital, uh, there are two separate uh, services: neurosurgery and then as endovascular. So that is why some that is why sometimes it's quite we understand it's quite difficult to send the patient there to to perform that is why we do not use it routinely maybe we if we, I had it in my department altogether maybe we do a little bit more so that's for, I, I, for I, petroclival for petroclival meningiomas which are deep and inaccessible you may still consider uh, the middle meningeal artery embolization but. Uh, but I think, as you said, it, there, there are risks associated with these procedures and, and you can always uh, get them via surgical uh, route. Those who have done it enough, they know that it's not that big a problem as it's been told in, in conferences by our other colleagues who do it both ways. So mm -hmm. I think that is one indication which I have striked off from my practice and I'm, I'm yet to go back to that. So I'll probably not do that uh, ever unless somebody still comes with a big petroclival meningioma and says, okay, can you devascularize it because it's deep and inaccessible. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kumar. And may I also uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Farid, the President of the Surgical Society of Afghanistan, uh, to share your opinion and for uh, any questions. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Konnichiwa. And, uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alexander. It was uh, very interesting and uh, good lecture. And was it was for learning purposes. It was very best step by step, and it's good for uh, young Nilsanjan and for us all, also. It was good, and uh, it was all, also uh, the other uh, uh, point is that with. Like our countries, with uh, limited resources, it was good, and uh, you uh, your recommendation was very best. And thank you very much. It was uh, uh, really good. And but uh, sometimes uh, the meningium, uh, but involved the dura, and do you uh, recommend for dura policy as well, or or keep the dura? Uh, and uh, dissect and keep the dura uh, and put it, but your advice. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Pizar. Uh, no, I recommend to always recommend uh, to, uh, to uh, reject 
the the adjacent euro. Even when you do not see a real invasion, uh, I recommend to reject it completely. Always, you know, always. If as much as it possible, as it much as possible. Okay. Uh, they are cool to be. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, you're welcome. Good luck. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Dr. Sachin, before uh, we had also a webinar with the uh, Afghanistan Neurosurgical Society and uh, Dr. Bakhtiar Burhani, our uh, Afghan neurosurgeon in Netherlands, uh, he had a best presentation for our uh, young neurosurgeon about uh, pituitary tumor uh, mm -hmm. surgery. And uh, he is also in the attendance uh, today. And uh, I uh, like sometimes we uh, invite him for a presentation as well. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Professor Fawad. We'll definitely, I'll contact uh, Professor Dr. Burani. Uh, uh, I promoted him in the panelist. Dr. Burani, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Good Hello, evening Dr. and uh, good afternoon. <laughs> We are all over the world here. Uh, so I am enjoying uh, your webinar. And uh, if I have time, I, I make time. And uh, it was excellent uh, lecture, um, uh, Professor um, Alexander. So very basic and uh, uh, good recommendations. So uh, I agree with him that embolization, also our other colleague in Toronto, I guess, um, Komar, um, uh, I, I do. I don't use any embolization before uh, such surgery because, um, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, there's uh, uh, almost uh, very narrow connection between external and uh, internal vascularization. So this could jeopardize the, the patient. So the removal first step is always to, to dissect the vascularization to find that. And drilling, it is a very good technique, as uh, Alexander told, just uh, uh, lowers the part to, to find the manager artery and, and to coagulate that. Uh, so it is, it is a good step. So we'll, I want to use that uh, the next step, this recommendation. So I'm enjoying, enjoying your, your webinar. And also Professor Kato, um, um, uh, she's very, very kind and uh, as I uh, so uh, she wants uh, to to help the neurosurgical society in Afghanistan. So I'm I'm also the same trying from uh, other uh, uh, parts uh, in the Netherlands. I'm a neurosurgeon. So if we uh, 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 get together, we can also uh, get uh, neurosurgery to a higher level in uh, in our country in Afghanistan. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank, you so thank, you. thank you, Dr. Burani. Uh, Professor Fawad, please, uh, please share uh, Dr. Burani's uh, email address with me, and then okay. I'll contact him for our future webinars also. Okay, so, okay. Thank you very much. Now, the, uh, I think the hall, yes, the hall is open for the questions. I could see Dr. Dilshad had a hand raised, and then the hand has come down. Dr. Dilshad, are you, you still want to ask a question? Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Oh, a nice presentation, it was very informative. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, Professor Kato. Nice to see you there. Um, uh, my question is, uh, you, um, you, you said that uh, you resect uh, the tumor from the brain surface, from the cortex. And um, when meningioma is uh, highly invasive and uh, highly attached to the cortex, uh, you try to leave a piece of uh, uh, of the meningioma on the surface on the cortex. Uh, is that right? I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dilshot, uh, for this question. I I want to mm, uh, to, to cl clarify uh, my statement about this resection. So I speak only about eloquent errors. Eloquent errors. Okay. Only, only. All the other okay. errors, of course, of course, we must be uh, uh, maximally radical. Because any mm -hmm. tumor left behind uh, could uh, regrow, potentially. And uh, 
I have a few cases during my practice when I stopped uh, on the stage of rosect of dissection from the um, uh, dermatous brain, and then in one one and a half year I performed perform the second stage of surgery, and I easily dissected this uh, rem uh, remain tu this tumor from from the surface. I had no mm -hmm. no edema. There were no edema. There, were, uh, there was a arachnoid plane. And I, but this, you cannot use it routinely this way, but it's better to uh, leave the shell on the eloquent area mm -hmm. co uh, cortex, then observe if it growing, if it, if it progress, uh, you may recommend the, the next second stage surgery to safely remove uh, this tumor. So I, I did it mm -hmm. a couple of times, yeah. not routinely, not sometimes uh, I, I do it also. So that's, that's all. Okay. Yes, thank you so much. And I can You're see wrong. there are some uh, questions uh, in the Q&A chat box as well. So uh, from the uh, Dr. Ashet, so uh, he's asking, uh, uh, what do you do for the recurrent atypical meningioma? I think the answer was, uh, you already answered the question. And another question is about uh, any experience of the exoscopes as it's gaining uh, popularities. The third question is about um, uh, if there is a cavernous uh, sinus meningioma with uh, emission of the blood vessels. So how would you deal with that? So uh, thank you, Professor, for answering this question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very good questions and very tough questions. Uh, concerning exoscope, I have experience uh, for surgery with them. It's very good tool. I like it very much. Uh, I have not it for my everyday uh, surgery. I had uh, I have it uh, like for testing, and I operated on quite on quite uh, quite complex uh, tumors, skull based tumors, uh, um, intramedullary tumors, uh, and uh, I want to say that I really enjoyed the surgery. So maybe in, in, in nearest future future I will have uh, one and I will do it. Uh, I will operate on with it. First of all, it's much easier for neurosurgeon. It's physically easier, uh, easier for neurosurgeon to operate on because you can move your hand. You can uh, you, you cannot the, the stiff. Uh, you have not the stiff muscles. So physically, uh, it's it's much easier. Uh, technically, I think it's, uh, it's it's not worse uh, than the microscope. So it uh, provides all the benefits of the microsurgery, and. Uh, it's uh, very comfortable for me, so I found it very comfortable, and I think that it's, um, the the tool is worth to have it to have it in the in, in the OR. Concerning this uh, second question about um, cavernous, cavernous sinus uh, meningioma, uh, first of all, I never will recommend radio surgery without. Uh, uh, without budge. And it depends because it, it could be absolutely different tumor. Sometimes it's possible to obtain the material from transnasal approach when it uh, protrude to the uh, to the um, sphenoid sinus i'd better to take example from from there just, just check uh, the check uh, the histology and then to think about from the other hand sometimes uh, meningioma of uh, cavernous sinus could be removed uh, completely so and in my practice, I always try to remove it. And believe me, it's, I can. Um, I think in the, in the half of cases, I remove this tumor. Uh, so I identify all the anatomical structures, and uh, patients have no neurological deterioration. But if I see that the tumor is adhered, if it will growing, <clears throat> so it, if it invades uh, and the, the uh, nerves are included on the tumor, and I cannot dissect them. I I I, I limit. Uh, I stop the surgery on the on on the biopsy of the tumor. That's all. But I always try. I, I always always try. I even had one um, one time a couple of years ago. I had uh, two absolutely identical tumors on the MRI. First, 
one was uh, removed completely. The second one, I performed on the bias. But in both cases, I, I, I tried to remove. My last was uh, on, was on uh, Friday. My last, it, I also removed this tumor completely from the coronal sinus without no new deficit of the tumor. Even patient had the had the trigeminal neurology trigeminal uh, neuralgia. Uh, so at least uh, until today, she had no no strokes, no 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 pain after surgery. So, and uh, you asked it about the malignant. Did you? Uh, we discussed it. So I think that's all. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Ben okay. and uh, Professor Alexander Bosnia. Are there any other questions from the panelists or the delegates? If not, then we'll move ahead uh, and uh, request Dr. Ben to kindly introduce uh, our YNS speaker and uh, please. So, okay, uh, thank you, Sachin. And uh, today, uh, for the final speaker, it's our honor to invite uh, Dr. Habiburu uh, Kasanov, the new surgeon of the Department of Skull Base Surgery at the Republican Specialized Scientific Medical Medicine Center of Real Surgery of the Minister of Health of the Republic of Uganda, uh, Tashkent, and uh, in the Tashkent at the Uganda. So uh, today he will be presenting on the topic of the combined endoscopic transcranial and endoscopic transrenal surgery. So, um, so uh, uh, may I invite uh, Dada Habiburu to share your screen? Uh, dear professors and other participants of this webinar, and uh, thank you for your all. Uh, thank you especially for Dr. Ben for excellent introduction and thanks for Dr. Professor Wozniak for informative and educational presentation. It was very useful and helpful for us the young neurosurgeons. And so I'm very grateful to be here as a, a young neurosurgeon, young speaker. So today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, combined uh, approach, endoscopic combined and transfinal surgery and transcranial surgery uh, because of my latest experience as a fellow in Japan. So let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay. So it is visible for all. Yes, uh, it's working now. Okay, so my topic is uh, combined endoscopic uh, transfinodal, endonasal transfinodal surgery and endoscopic uh, in, uh, transcranial surgery. So uh, the combined approach can be utilized in various cellular and paracellular lesions, including uh, spinal wing meningiomas, cellular meningiomas, cellular adenomas, and other uh, cellular regions tumor and uh, anterior cranial fossa tumors. So uh, depending on the use of uh, visualization systems, combined approach uh, can be uh, just uh, used by uh, endoscope and the macroscope and exoscope. So it is always uh, utilized uh, to treat uh, giant cellular adenomas and the uh, meningiomas with uh, paracellular, anterior cellular, and intercellular extensions, and different kind of uh, giant craniopharyngiomas and uh, other uh, lesions which spreads beyond the uh, current carotid arteries and the cellular regions. So the most common one is uh, pituitary adenomas as a, among the other neoplasms of uh, brain, it's a CERT. And uh, it is very uh, difficult to manage uh, and uh, uh, four millimeter or more maximum diameters and pituitary uh, uh, have always have four and more millimeters and uh, they always accompanied by pituitary dysfunction and uh, endocrinological changes. And it comes with a limited working space along with vascular encasement, 
proximate Z nearby to neurological structures, and it's always firm and requiring multimodal approaches. So as uh, the uh, most common symptoms is a uh, visual disturbance and uh, cranial nerve palsy is regarding uh, to uh, eye movements. So uh, second one is a uh, meningiomas. Uh, they also can present as uh, paracellular extension and a firm consistency and the vascular encasement. Uh, they always uh, just uh, cause for uh, requiring a combined uh, multimodal approach. And so according to use of uh, um, surgical microscopes and the uh, endoscopic system, and the latest one is uh, excellent, uh, famous for this uh, excellent uh, visualization system is uh, exoscopic system. Um, combined approach can be a microscopic transfinadal and a microscopic transcranial approach. And the endoscopic transfinadal and the microscopic transcranial approach and the microscopic transfinadal and uh, endoscopic transcranial uh, approach, but it is a more rare case, and I have never experienced and seen this case. Uh, and the next one is endoscopic, uh, fully endoscopic transfinadal surgery and endoscopic transcranial surgery. And the last one is endoscopic transfinadal surgery, and uh, it's, it's combination use of uh, exoscopic systems, exoscopic transcranial approach. So uh, mm, all uh, standard uh, endoscopic transfinadal approach can be utilized and uh, skull base uh, uh, bone can must be removed as much as wider and we need to open or to do wide extended approach and transfinadal approach to uh, have a better visualization to early decompress of uh, optic canal and so on. So uh, among the transcranial approaches is uh, the, the most famous one is a supraorbital uh, microscopic uh, subfrontal craniotomy. So subfrontal craniotomy, uh, it's, it can be used uh, for various anterior middle cranial facet tumors and especially tumors of regions. In this approach, uh, we need to use a retraction of frontal lobe and which may cause injury to brain parenchyma resulting in a postoperative uh, seizures, for example. And uh, this technique, better even uh, this techni techniques is better visualizes uh, neurovascular structures uh, such as uh, optic nerve and the both uh, ipsilateral and uh, contralateral uh, internal carotid artery and the uh, ICA A1 ACO and the cavernous sinus and uh, some uh, cranial nerves. Uh, but uh, it uh, is always uh, combined with uh, some. Uh, procedure related complications such as brain uh, relaxation. So uh, in terms of uh, the removal of uh, giant uh, tumors in the cellular regions and just uh, frontal lobe relaxation due to um, gravity may not be enough because of size of tumor. So that's why it's always accompanied by brain uh, frontal lobe uh, retraction. So next approach is a, a better modified endoscopic supraorbital keyhole craniotomy. As a concept of this is a smaller skin incision, smaller scar formation, and a smaller craniotomy. And uh, it uh, is the insertion of endoscopic. It uh, helps us, us to visualize nearby structures because of different angles of endoscope, and uh, we can achieve a better removal rate for uh, limited selected cases. So next one is uh, endoscopic, just a, con a conventional microscopic pteranal craniotomy or in other words, frontal temporal craniotomy. Uh, it also requires some uh, frontal lobe retraction and uh, even the sexual splitting of transylvan fissures. And it sometimes may be difficult because of uh, secondary vascular, uh, vascular was a spasm and some uh, iatrogenic injuries and the uh, postoperative schizes can be uh, cured uh, because of this approach as well. And the endoscopic or exoscopic pteranal keyhole craniotomy, it's a, also a good option. Uh, uh, advantages of uh, uh, exoscopy is uh, so it uh, fulfill uh, disadvantages of uh, endoscopic approach because while inserting this along the surgical corridor, we cannot uh, visualize, we cannot control 
uh, the structures behind the visualization of endoscopic system, and sometimes we can injure it, some uh, neurovascular structures. So uh, this fulfilled with use of uh, endoscopic systems. And the uh, next one is endoscopic cylinder surgery. It's the most latest one uh, based on the uh, smaller cylinder incisions. And so it always uh, accompanied by small craniotomy and it causes minimal white matter injury compared to uh, conventional uh, microscopic transcortical approaches. And the use of uh, digital uh, tensor, tensor imaging uh, helps us to uh, visualize the subcortical fibers and uh, have to uh, teach us how to avoid uh, and to these systems and uh, this minimal and the smaller diameter of and this insertion system tubular retractions and always uh, spread the distension uh, tension and uh, to the um, surrounding brain parenchyma is it always equal and it's small and that's why uh, it uh, helps to reduce uh, uh, parenchymal uh, brain parenchymal injury and itself it's um, may lead to uh, reduce and in uh, postoperative seizure compl complications such as seizures and uh, uh, microscopic, exoscopic, and endoscopic uh, interhemispheric transcolosal approach is also used for different kind of giant pituitary tumors, uh, especially with uh, uh, extension to the intracranial side towards the third ventricle. So uh, this approach is very helpful, but it's uh, uh, associated with the dissection of uh, real uh, just fiber tracts of uh, just corpus callosums. And uh, uh, let's to, uh, talk about this, uh, uh, its classification. The most earliest classification is uh, uh, by producer, uh, introduced by Hardy and Wesner. And so according to them, uh, this uh, classification system has uh, uh, about uh, five or four grading systems. So according to them, and the first one, uh, and a zero, grade zero, and just characterized by as a smaller size of, of a lesion within a pituitary, uh, a pituitary gland, and there's no erosion of uh, bone. And uh, grade one is accompanied by uh, less than 10 millimeter uh, tumor, which is limited to the cellar area, but uh, it's uh, slightly blotchy uh, or some uh, slope uh, to the uh, cellar floor may cause some uh, bone uh, obstructions. And the grade two is a tumor, it limits the cellar, has a size more than 10 millimeters and which local expansion and the cellar floor is uh, intact. And uh, uh, grade three, uh, in this stage, uh, tumor erodes uh, cellar floor completely and uh, spreads supracellular systems and uh, may uh, just uh, Distract this uh, optic nerve and the suprachiasmatic uh, cisterns. And this uh, grade uh, four uh, just characterized it by uh, diffuse erosion of cellular floor and destruction of the entire floor. And we call it is a ghost cellular where tumor expands posteriorly or superiorly, reaching the chiasm. And it is always adherent to the pituitary stalk. And even it dislocates those structures reaching the uh, third ventricles. So, uh, grade one and the grade uh, zero is always usually more less than 10 millimeters. So, it's considered microadenomas, and the rest of all are uh, um, macroadenomas. So, despite this utilities of Hardy Wilson class, Weissner classification that is relevant for surgery and the biology. So, uh, but it distinct, can distinguish between invasive and non-invasive adenomas, uh, but it uh, will not, uh, it cannot describe, and but it describes the cavernous sinus invasion. So that's why it can, it uh, had been uh, modified by, later by uh, Wilson. So according to Wilson, as uh, tumor is uh, graded like, um, a and B, C and D, according to the, its supracellular extension and extension to, to the towards a cavernous sinus. And so there are um, this uh, another uh, classification which is better described. This is uh, 
cell of um, terminal sinus extension uh, lesions and modified scales. So uh, in my, about 30 years ago, uh, NOSP uh, introduced it as a classification system based on uh, covenant sinus extension. And they use it a uh, tree, uh, perpendicular and just a line which crosses uh, uh, based on a uh, supraclinement um, and uh, intercovenous carotid artery. So there are two and uh, three lines. This is a medial tangets. And this, this is a medial line and, uh, or intercavernous lines, and this is lateral sides. And grade zero, uh, so uh, it's always uh, uh, measured by coronal MRI, uh, contrast MRI uh, plans. And so uh, grade two more, uh, medial, uh, always uh, just a medial to medial line. And when it passes just a medial triangle, it becomes a grade one. And grade two uh, just uh, crosses medial inter medial line intercarotid uh, inter carotid line, and this, uh, but uh, they don't uh, dissect this uh, third line lateral to. So uh, uh, when it's uh, just starts uh, across uh, lateral tangent, uh, if it is a supracavernous superior to a cavernous carotid artery, it's three A or it's three B and when it uh, uh, spreads uh, below covered and carotid arteries and there is in cavernous sinus parts. And so uh, grade four is a complete involvement of cavernous uh, carotid arteries. So a main indication for combined approaches is a dumbbell or hourglass shapes tumors with a symmetric supracellular uh, extension is a sagittal uh, in a sagittal plan into anterior cranial fascia or posterior cranial fascia uh, tumor extension in the coronal plan into the middle fossa. And advantages of uh, combined approaches uh, uh, as follows is a cooperation from two surgical direction. For example, uh, they use adaptive visualization and continuous control of uh, tumor removal stages uh, if a tumor is removed by one uh, team, for example, an endoscopic uh, transfinadal surgery team, uh, transcranial surgery team can march and, uh, and show on the control of tumor removal, and uh, it helps the preservation of critical uh, structures. And uh, there is, that's why uh, there are minimal complications and uh, maximum and safe resection and it always accompanied by uh, uh, less cost because uh, everyone knows that uh, two surgery costs up to um, too much money. So it is always cost reducing. And the reduction is the risk of post-operative hemorrhage, especially uh, from uh, pituitary adenomas when you use alone uh, transcranial approach alone or endoscopic transfinadal approach alone. If there is always uh, this in stand up uh, giant pituitary adenomas, uh, post-operative hemorrhage from residual uh, tumors always occurs and it's a uh, life threatening. So uh, better orientation is the uh, next uh, one is of uh, advantages. And uh, among the advantages, always the disadvantages. So first one is the positioning because of uh, surgical field. So in a small, even larger surgical sectors, operation sector, uh, just positioning of uh, surgical setups such as microscopes, two microscopes, for example, sometimes some limits uh, space for surgeon and uh, uh, makes a discomfort for the uh, better or uh, productive work. And uh, it's always invasive because two approaches. And so uh, this uh, operating setups must be here, just uh, we can see this endoscopic systems, and uh, uh, microscopic system and endoscopic system, scrub nurse, the, so uh, it is not uh, difficult for endoscopic and uh, the nasal team uh, to perform endoscopic approach, uh, even as patient position and heat is just located, situated according to uh, transcranial surgery team preferences but the use of a microscope a uh, bit limited. So uh, this uh, advancement of uh, um, endoscopic system or exoscopic system, this limited space uh, can be improved. 
So uh, there should be uh, some uh, extinct uh, rules uh, that uh, everyone should follow. Uh, first is uh, always uh, we must keep each surgical team's instrumentation systems in two separate uh, tables. So they cannot and don't do interfere with each others. And uh, there are always some main uh, uh, surgeons, which is a most important one. And because uh, he is always one of the seniors and experienced doctors, uh, he can provide both endoscopic transfinal surgery team and uh, transcranial endoscopic or microscopic tra endoscopic transcranial surgery team with the precise instructions by uh, observing visualization of uh, both displays. And uh, he can guide one team and the second team and to uh, achieve a better and a safer and a maximal resection of the tumors. Uh, so uh, surgical techniques is uh, and uh, we perform a standard expanded endoscopic endonasal approach. We use a rigid endoscope with the pneumatic holders in the arm uh, Olympus Tokyo Japan. And we always use a single nostril approach and a paraceptal approach. We do a wide spinotomy, we remove uh, both tuberculum cell and uh, planium and the cellular floor, as well as we do and the uh, just optic canal decompression to achieve earlier optic nerve decompression because you know and cellular region tumors are most commonly spreads into the uh, optic canal and uh, because of uh, smaller diameters of the canal and optic nerve it causes a very uh, compressive uh, optic neuropathy and so uh, we do uh, optic decompression, canal decompression by this approach. So uh, we always use an internal debulking and we don't uh, detach or we don't uh, push the tumor and we use an intracapsular removal and uh, to reduce the size of tumor. And then we identify as a, a distinct uh, the borders between the tumors and the pituitary glands and, and dissect it. And there's uh, a part of tumors, uh, which is uh, just closed tightly adherent to critical structures such as optic nerve, optic chasm, or uh, in just ACOM or internal carotid arteries. So, so uh, it can be uh, removed by transcranial team, or if, if it is possible, we can uh, not remove uh, for uh, reducing the complication rates. So observation and marking clinical structures for transcranial team uh, uh, or uh, transcranial uh, transnasal surgery team is uh, always uh, assisted by another, each other. So one is removing, uh, second is observing and helping or pushing down the tumor to uh, introduce it as an intercellular space, uh, inter just uh, infracellular space. So we, use always, we always use multi-layer reconstruction system, uh, uh, reconstruction for skull-based reconstruction with a dural suturing. Uh, we do a rigid reconstruction to, with uh, absorbable plates, or sometimes we can use a uh, nasal septum bone, which we remove it uh, in early stages of surgery. So transcranial approach, so as uh, mentioned above, there are many kind of approach. So we don't to focus on this in the slides. And this, uh, this is a case of, um, I was it 10 years, 2010, which underwent uh, combined endoscopic surgery at Nagoya University Hospital. Where I'm uh, just in this near endoscopic uh, surgery fellow now. For the last uh, six months, I'm studying this case. So uh, we perform at uh, different uh, uh, approaches for in this, in, uh, cellular region uh, tumors, such as non-functional pituitary adenomas, meningiomas, germ cells tumors, craniopharyngiomas. And uh, so I, will, I will here experience, share some of them as a illustrative case. So first the patient is a 50 year old man uh, who is a no, diagnosed with a non-function in a pituitary adenomas, NOSP4 in a great year by Hardy Wilson. 
and we perform according to uh, just studying a uh, proprietive MRI, uh, which uh, just analyzed its cell tumor is spread just uh, superiorly toward the third ventricle and even lateral ventricle here. And is it all, uh, always there is that um, uh, possibility of hemorrhage. Uh, so uh, initially, patient treated by insertion of reservoir on Maya to reduce uh, hydrocephalus degree intracranial pressure uh, that happened due to interoperative tumoral hemorrhage. And so later, we prefer, decided to perform uh, combine it simultaneously in the scope of transfindal surgery and exoscopic transcranial uh, cylinder surgery. Um, it's, so, uh, properative MRI uh, CT, you can see this is a properative CT tumor getting invasive to towards the left uh, right cavernous sinus, and it is starting to extend uh, superiorly toward intracranial side, compressing a uh, third ventricle, causing a compressive hyd um, hydrocephalus. So, uh, patient was treated before this is a a shunting systems, shunts inserted to just to aqueducts. So this is sagittal plan. It is very uh, visible here. Shunting system, so gives to just, it is the tumor uh, from lateral ventricles to just four ventricles. So uh, based on this uh, uh, study, uh, we, Study detail in this case focusing on uh, superior extension and the uh, previously shunting uh, site and uh, to achieve safer and a maximal resection. We have decided to perform uh, this combined approach from this site and just uh, from the site of previous surgery. Uh, so uh, our team is uh, located like this. So uh, this is a um, uh, screen uh, monitor of endoscopic endonasal team and this and this is a transcranial surgery so is, uh, you can see this uh, insertion of uh, cylinder and uh, so uh, visually perform a single nostril approach as we said above so we use the interpretive ICG to visualize neurovascular structures so this is a Paraceptal incision always done in front of uh, middle turbinate after removal anterior sphenoid uh, wall. So we perform this as much as later with such a dural and a PCML removal and internal debulking. So during this tumor removal, as we see it uh, from you now from proprietary MRI, so it is extended to superiorly. So the always tumor uh, can be pushed down by uh, transcranial surgery team. So here, uh, in a transcranial site, they push down infracellular site and so that uh, in the nasal team can remove it uh, safely uh, without not injuring, uh, without injuring any neural uh, critical structures. So don't really move the tumor. And the uh, next is there is a transcranial surgery team. So we use along this uh, small craniotomy, we remove a uh, reservoir of Maya, and uh, we are starting here to insert as uh, this uh, sheets cylinder. You can see this tumor capsules. And uh, so along this is horoid plexus and the uh, uh, septal uh, veins and certain thalamus stratus, vascular society, uh, structures you can see them and we observe this. And transcurrent surgery team just push it down. Now is it pushing down here and this is his pushing. Here is we are pushing now uh, to downward uh, to have uh, this and this is he. Uh, here. So uh, after a uh, complete removal to, of tumor, uh, transcranial surgic, surgery team can continuously irrigate surgical fields. This is how we are removing the tumor.
So this is a post-operative MRI, very complete uh, tumor removal, total resection, and there's a hematoma capsule. And uh, here is a pituitary gland, which was uh, dislocated uh, just uh, to the left side. So we preserved it, we even we preserved pituitary stalks, and the patient has no complication rates, no uh, uh, CSF uh, leaks and then uh, no pituitary uh, endocrinological dysfunctions. And uh, this is a second case, 28 year old, 23 year old male. In this case, uh, we perform a uh, uh, combined approach as well. And this patient had a relapsing ulcerative, uh, just a relapsing ulcerative colitis uh, with a bitemporal hemanopsia and presented uh, at Nagoya University Hospital. And, but before this, uh, this patient was attempted to treat by endoscopic endonasal surgery uh, in the, one of the prefectural hospitals in Japan. And uh, during intraoperative uh, removal, the surgeon uh, found that the tumor is a firm and fibrous consistency. So it was a uh, difficult to remove it completely by uh, just uh, uh, endoscopic endonasal surgery alone. So uh, later patient referred to Nagoya University Hospital and the proprietive MRI uh, showed uh, that uh, there is a tumor uh, that's a little mass uh, with a superior and a bit uh, lateral extension towards the cell ventricle and the lateral ventricles. And uh, because of tumor was a fibrous and uh, uh, firm consistency, it is mm -hmm. difficult to remove it because at first when you preserve arachnoid and uh, push as a regular vent uh, for whatever maneuver to increase intracranial pressure that always helpful in endoscopic endonasal surgery where is no tumor with not firm and consistency is not hard. At this intracranial pressure push down the tumor towards the transnasal site so you can remove it easily. But when it's firm and fibrous, it's not easy as that's why it can be removed by a combined approach. Why? Because of a, or possible uh, postoperative hemorrhage from residual uh, tumor, uh, we should uh, perform a combined approach. So intraoperative, uh, preoperative DTI studies, uh, for example, helps us to avoid this uh, subcortical fiber structs such as bilateral pyramidal fiber tracts, left inferior front occipital fasciculus, and the left superior uh, longitudinal. Uh, and temporal fasciculus. So and we avoid this and we uh, identify, determine this just a guidance and a corridor of surgical corridor for cylinder uh, surgery. So uh, despite uh, of uh, above mentioned uh, findings, we also uh, identified that uh, because of CT and geography, there was intercavernous artery uh, aneurysms so it was uh, tumor was strongly attached to this aneurysm during intraoperative tumor removal. So, and the tumor also was attached to uh, uh, both uh, internal uh, uh, A1, internal carotid uh, artery branch A1 and A1. It was strongly adhered to optic nerve. So we decided to not remove, uh, to avoid uh, optic nerve injury, vascular injury, and there's a rupture of intercavernous aneurysms. So patients uh, discharged after uh, on the 10 days of, on, on the post-operative day 10, and uh, there's no complication, right? No neurological disturbance, no post-operative hemorrhage, and no thing, and the patient is treated in this, and now is a follow-up period, so there is no tumor growth. And the next case is a five-year-old male, uh, also diagnosed uh, non-functional pituitary adenomas, and uh, NOSP4, and uh, by Harley-Wilson grade A, 
an endoscopic transfinal surgery, and uh, we use it here, exoscopic system, exoscopic pteronal K-hole cranet, pteronal cranatomy. So as you can see, this tumor is extended superiorly uh, and uh, laterally toward the sylvan fissure site. So uh, that's why use of supraorbital approach or just cylinder surgery is not just not helpful here. So we decided to uh, pteronal keyhole, pteronal uh, approach by exoscope. So our guidance like this, we use it. So in during surgery, uh, this approach is very helpful because it can uh, push uh, this part of tumor toward the center transfinder the surgery team sites so that it uh, can be removed uh, effectively. And uh, this is uh, our operative team surgeons. So you can see here this endoscopic endonasal surgery team and their screens. And this is exoscopic surgery team. This surgeon is holding exoscope and uh, watching this uh, cyst, uh, monitors here in a present patient positioning position it uh, here. This is very uh, quite comfortable because I uh, see it uh, patient is uh, look at uh, so just uh, in the nasal surgery team side and it is convenient for even it is convenient for and transcranial surgery team. And so skin incision is uh, along the behind the higher line. So um, use of the exoscopic system is better because we have a better visualization in a 3D format. So here you can see how a 3D image looks like. So we can see the better visualization here by exoscopic team. So that is very helpful. And then this is a surgical video. Uh, it is a conventional approach, extended transfinal approach, removing nasal septum, and we are here removing this uh, spinal rostrum. And then um, we do a wide uh, opening of anterior spinal valve, and this this is this incision of. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Kavibullo, but we are, we are running a little bit uh, short on time. We've got 10 minutes okay. to finish the webinar. So maybe we can just a uh, little hurry up or summarize. Okay. So this is the last case. So uh, with the six silver fissures. Okay, I will miss it now. So we completely uh, remove the tumor here and uh, the construction and the degree of primacy follows is decreased in postoperative course. So there is no postoperative CSF flex. So we are removing here tumor. And uh, because of time limit, I have to uh, pass, uh, skip this um, section. So. So we hear the bulking chemo. So helping in transnasal surgery team, also remote tumor. And uh, there's a uh, transfinal surgery team is just in these sites. They are attempting to do uh, intracapsular removal. So, This is a, a section of um, by transnasal surgery team. We are just observing uh, so that he don't uh, uh, injure the uh, critical structures. So this is a uh, one of the advantages of combined approach. And uh, this is a postoperative MRI. 
achieve it, uh, gross total resection. And uh, we use uh, endoscopy keyhole surgery for this transcellular surgery team, uh, cylinder surgery, and this is a postoperative MRI. And, uh, and this is uh, from our previous case. So uh, we perform it and it's a probital keyhole approach about 15 patients. And this is a left renal approach. This is a postoperative MRI. And this is also uh, interhemispheric approach we use because of uh, close to uh, supracellular area intracranial side. And this is an example of combined endoscopic and supraorbital keyhole approach. Uh, skin incision in about 2.5 centimeter craniotomy. And this is a uh, interoperative view from transcranial side, this tumor. And this is after this section and this optic nerve, internal carotid artery and cranial nerve three. And this is a our surgical results. So um, there's some adherence of, because of adherence to optic nerves, so some of patient uh, experienced visual deterioration. And the uh, key health approach we use it. When and there's no deterioration, just change it or improve it. So conclusion, so combined transfundal transcranial surgery is useful, but invasive, but uh, is the introduction of keyhole concepts in attempts to reduce uh, the invasiveness of these procedures. And the combined transfundal surgery uh, is also effective for giant pituitary uh, lesions, especially lesos buried deep in the brain and uh, it decreases uh, risk of postoperative uh, hemorrhage from residual tumor. And the primary benefits of surgery using cylinder is uh, reduce uh, Reduced size, reduced size of surgical corridor and the distribution of the retraction pressure equal to the surrounding brain, parenchyma, which decreases the occurrence of uh, retraction injury and which decreases uh, postoperative seizures. So, uh, linear cortical incisions also can reduce it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kabibullo. They were interesting cases and uh, very good surgical techniques, uh, very unusual, uh, you've showed, but uh, because of short of time, uh, I requested you to wind up. And because of short of time, I just request a short comment from our uh, faculties, uh, Professor Ibrahim first, then uh, Professor Alexander, uh, and then Dr. Ashish Kumar and Dr. Fawad in that order. Uh, just a short comment. I'm really sorry, but we're running a little short of time. We have to finish in 10 minutes. Uh, Professor Ibrahim, could you please come yes, down, yes. Uh, Dr. Kabibullah? Thank you, Shahid. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Habibullah, nice lecture. Thank you to remind us for all those, those approaches. Uh, short question. If we have uh, CNOSP 2 to 4 grades, for example, or even one of cavernous sinus involvement uh -huh. of micro uh, adenomas, uh -huh. will, and we have obviously a, a prolactin uh, level high. Do you think we should start surgery or wait for the bromergolin, cabergolin, or, or bromocryptin or something for, for weeks to, to see is there any uh, shrinkage of the tumor? What do you think to, for prolactinomas? Uh. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your questions. So uh, it depends on the uh, symptoms that patients have. Uh, but I think, uh, I, as I am young, uh, but uh, many doctors think that prolactinomas can be treated uh, by med medical treatment. So we, uh, sometimes we need to follow up uh, if patient did not develop any uh, symptoms such as visual disturbance or oculometer abduction or nerve palsies. And so uh, we have to follow up and uh, sometimes it depends on the surgical, uh, just uh, symptoms uh, that patient have at the time of admission. So it's too a bit better to uh, observe, follow up, and uh, if it develops and if it's uh, medical treatment is, uh, effect, is not effective, but it usually helps uh, compared to other kind of epidural adenomas. Uh, so, uh, we have to follow up. It depends on the symptoms. Yeah, 
Yeah, I agree. So if you have young guy with with a prolactinoma, large prolactinomas, and even if you have mild mild level of visual disturbance, uh, maybe we can just start from with the transvenoidal direct approach for the little bit the compression of the optical nerve and chiasm, and then wait for the weeks with the with the medication before we start with the cranial surgery opening this is my opinion thank you thank you we are trying we are i'm trying to save the time Shahin. thank you thank you thank you professor uh professor alexander wojnak bolnavas вопрос okay thank you very much uh, thank you dr kasano thank you excellent presentation so and con congratulation to your team uh, because uh, really impressive case a really really impressive surgery uh, i have some comments uh, first of all concerning the cannula mm -hmm. you put uh, in the brain for endoscopy uh, actually it's also a retractor you put the tube and you have a permanent uh, retraction of the brain surrounded. If we will observe the, uh, the destiny of the surrounding brain, uh, it's, you will see the, the severe gliosis around, around the corridor. So sometimes for microsurgery, microsurgery without retractor, when you use only instruments like a retractor system, it's less traumatic than uh, endoscopic. It's my comment. <coughs> and another comment for transcolosal, I think that uh, microsurgery is still less invasive than endoscopy. For me, in my hands, uh, one centimeter of colostomy is quite enough to perform the effective surgery, any, any surgery in, in the ventricle to that's that's my comment thank you very much really very good experience really impressive thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you very much professor may i ask dr ashish kumar to make a comment about dr Bigelow's presentation uh, uh, thank you so much uh, dr kasano excellent presentation uh, and you have taken down some big giant tumors from that approach so I think it is working well in your hands. So um, I, I look forward to your, uh, you know, uh, publication in this kind of approach where, you know, the other surgeon from the transcranial uh, side is pushing the tumor down and, and it's being excised from endos. I would be like uh, more interested in resecting the tumor and by both ways yeah. rather than pushing yeah. it down. Yeah. But uh, yes. again, it's, it's individuals, uh, you know, uh, approach towards the tumor. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I request Professor Fawad Birza uh, to make a short comment about Dr. Khabib Lokasano's presentation? Dr. Okay. Thank you. Salam. <coughs> Rahmat. Hello, uh, my uh, It was uh, good and best uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And congratulations, Tabikali, man, uh, for your achievement. And uh, it's good, uh, Dr. Sachin. I think that you know that the Uzbekistan is our neighbor country. Okay. And uh, I'm uh, thinking and looking that uh, possibility for sending some uh, our young neurosurgeon for uh, training. You know that the uh, medical education is a triad of knowledge, skill, and attitude. And uh, we got the knowledge from uh, this webinar conferences and books, but the scale is important. And uh, uh, it's possible for uh, uh, Dr. Habibullah Hassanov, uh, Dr. Dershad and uh, uh, their teams for uh, uh, possibility of training of, of, of uh, young neurosurgeons and also discussing uh, our cases with them. Uh, I like to make a team with them and with your uh, uh, cooperation as well. And Professor Kato uh, uh, also support us. Thank you very much. Thank Rahman. you. Thank you very much. I really apologize that we cannot take any questions uh, because of the short of time. But if anybody has any question, please mail it to me. I'll forward it to Kabi Bullo and I'm sure he'll uh, write back to you. And uh, then I would request Professor Yokutato to say a few uh, words before we close this uh, webinar. So first of all, uh, the uh, Habib, your presentation was very nice, very good. So you learned a lot at the Nagoya University, I think. So maybe the, the your concept, the treatment of the, the tumor has been totally changed after you came to Nagoya, Japan, I think. So I, I think uh, you should bring it back to your country 
Of course, uh, you need an uh, endoscope and exoscope both, I think, if you want to teach the Afghanistan or neighbor countries. But even though I mean, you can uh, collaborate with uh, the surrounding countries, uh, it was an excellent lecture conversation. And the, today we had a very nice uh, two uh, the, uh, good lectures, I think. So in the future, we, we want to ex uh, expect another good lectures for the YNS lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we will support your country and also the Afghanistan as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Arigato, Thank you very much. No. <laughs> Arigato. Arigato. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, participating. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.